Thanks so much. So I'm Alex Han. I work at Google Cloud. I write curriculum on machine learning and data, uh, including machine learning fairness. And today I'm presenting a talk called Responsible AI Practices, Fairness and Machine Learning. So what I'm going to talk about is some problems in fairness and machine learning, um, what some problems and challenges of developing tools for uh, fair tools in machine learning is, and then some solutions and stuff that we've come at Google to, to do that. So AI has this thing, clicker. Okay, let's do this. So AI has the the potential. It's rapidly growing in capacity, impact, and influence. So as designers and developers of AI systems, as many of you are in this room or are aspiring to, it's an imperative to understand the ethical considerations of our work. A tech-centric view that solely revolves around improving the capabilities of an intelligent system doesn't sufficiently consider human needs. An ethical, human-centric AI must be designed and developed in a manner that is aligned with the values and ethical principles of a society or the community effects. And when you talk about ethics, ethics is based on well-founded standards of right and wrong that prescribe what humans ought to do, usually in terms of rights, obligations, benefits to society, fairness, or specific virtues. So we recognize with such powerful technology, it raises equally powerful questions about its use. How AI is developed and used will have a significant impact on society for many years to come. So we've announced um, at Google as a leader in AI, we feel a deep responsibility to get this right. So we've announced seven principles to guide our work going forward. So these aren't theoretical concepts. They're concrete standards which actively govern our research and product development and actively um, impact our business decisions. You can check out all of these in details at ai.google slash principles. I want to focus on one of them today, though, and this is the second one, which is to avoid creating or reinforcing bias, the one in bold. So what does this mean? Well, the, the principle in full reads the following. AI algorithms and data sets can reflect, reinforce, or reduce unfair biases. We recognize that distinguishing fair from unfair biases is not always simple and differs across cultures and societies. We will seek to avoid unjust impacts on people, particularly those related to sensitive characteristics, such as race, ethnicity, gender, nationality, income, sexual orientation, ability, and political or religious belief. I also want to distinguish this bias from the bias in the statistical sense. Here we're talking about human biases. We're not necessarily talking about statistical biases, although these overlap uh, sometimes. So what are some of the challenges in working towards systems that are fair uh, and inclusive for all? Um, so the questions aren't always obvious and easy. So I want to take a step back and look at the whole of the machine learning pipeline. So if you're building a machine learning pipeline, you've collected some data. If it's a supervised learning case, the training data have to go through some kind of labeling or annotation process. These can be labeled in-house, but more and more these are being delegated out to crowd workers or an annotation service. After those first two steps, you're ready to begin training your model. You typically optimize for some common metrics or objective function. Then you're ready to serve, new data is fed into the model, customers are filtered, recommendations are ranked, and stats are aggregated. At the end of the process, people see some kind of an effect. They're provided with a particular service, they see a set of ads or product recommendations. Based on the feedback to the system, we, bring the, we begin the process all over again. So human behavior uh, informs further data collection. I want to drill down a bit and talk about the, the first two um, boxes in this, though. So unconscious bias. Unconscious bias, they exist in our data. And they exist in two forms. First, there's the human biases that exist in the data because data are found in the world, and data in the world has existing biases related to properties like gender, race, and sexual orientation. We can think of those biases in the terms of the ways that they kind of manifest in our data samples. So there could be reporting bias by our subjects because they only choose to reveal certain aspects of data about themselves or their opinions. There may be selection bias. That is, those subjects that get into our samples only represent a privileged type of user. There may be overgeneralization, where our samples are only representative of a particular type of user. And there may be outgroup homogeneity bias, where we think that people who are not in our sample are homogeneous, uh, whereas the people who are in our sample are diverse and nuanced. 
Second, we can also run into human biases which arise as part of our data collection and labeling procedures. Confidence and confirmation bias refer to overconfidence in our hypotheses, only looking for data which may confirm our hypotheses. Experimenter's bias refers to potentially influencing our subjects through the process of data collection. And automation biases refer to biases which crop up when the data that we get is solely the data which is easily automatable, only the things that we can collect. Okay, so we're missing something there. And the problem with this is that since we're starting with data with machine learning, um, that's going to reflect problems downsample. We're going to have skewed data, our model is going to be skewed, and we're going to have potentially biased outcomes in, in this. And so what enters is we have a machine learning pipeline that looks like this, but it also can potentially have human bias at every point of it. So we have to think about what kinds of data are accessible. Does the availability of data privilege a particular type of user? Does it put another group at a disadvantage? What transformations are you making to your data which may exclude one group compared to another? It can also appear in the process of labeling. What are the human biases that human annotators are introducing to your data? How stable are your categories of classification? And it can occur at the model level. Does a particular objective put certain subgroups of people at a disadvantage compared to a group in aggregate? And so these biases are going to appear downstream when we start doing serving uh, of our model. So the first big problem that we run into when creating uh, a machine learning system is this. ML problems um, learn from existing data collected from the real world. And so an accurate model may learn or even amplify problematic pre-existing biases on the data based on race, gender, religion, or other characteristics. And so I'm going to give you an example. So some research that a team that, uh, within Google led by uh, Ben Packer uh, wrote this up in a great blog post looking at what happens when we consider gender and race in, in word embeddings. Okay? If you're not familiar with word embeddings, I figure many of you are, but if you're not, um, they convert an input text into an output vector of numbers. Uh, so in the, in, and in the process, map semantically similar words near each other in the embedding space. So given a trained text embedding model, we can directly measure the associations the model has between words or phrases. So many of those associations are expected or helpful for language, uh, natural language processing tasks. And text embeddings are, are usually trained on elect electronically available corpora, such as Google News Text. And so um, this is a classic line from the Big Lebowski. The rug really tied the room together. And that gets mapped into a vector space. So what um, Ben and his team did they wanted to see how this would affect downstream tasks in natural language processing. So say you wanted to build a sentiment analyzer for, your movie, rev for movie reviews and use pre-trained text embeddings to do so. So you might, might want to use the IMDB data set to select negative or positive examples um, of what's, uh, what's positive and what's negative. And to show bias, you say, I'm going to append the phrase reviewed by and then put a name to understand the different types of biases which appear in classification due to different types of names. So what this plot shows is a difference in average sentiment scores on modified test sets where the phrase reviewed by plus a, uh, plus a name had been added to the end of each review. So the violin plots show the distribution over differences when models are trained on small samples of the original IMDB training data. So most of the training, so we have a difference here. We have African American uh, names versus European American names, and then female names versus male names, um, and then a various, various different types of pre tearing text embeddings, from the universal sentence decoder to glove, word to vec, no embedding at all, and then also um, these latter two, the NLM ones. Um, so most of the pre trained text embedding models exhibit some kind of Euro American bi name bias. Meanwhile, this, the universal sentence encoder exhibits a large bias in the direction of positiveness for male names, while the NNLM um, 50 exhibits a strong female name bias. So you might be asking, OK, sentiment analysis of movie reviews might not have many substantive downstream effects. But it's also easy to see how this is going to have downstream effects in other types of sentiment analysis in cases in which AI is being used to supplant human judgment. Another example, say you're building a messaging app that generates suggested replies, such as Smart Reply and Gmail. You might have a set of candidate replies for incoming messages, and um, you need to choose between candidate replies. One way you could do that is you could compare vectors generated by your word embeddings with the original query. 
In this case, we look at the cosine similarity between a candidate vector and the vector from the original query. So in this case, um, you have uh, some kind of uh, uh, a message like is the, is you get an email that says is the captain here today? Your candidates are yes she is yes he is, and then for that you can um, generate a, a, a score for each, and the bias score is the difference between the two. And so for this, uh, you create a templated list of responses that include is was your blank a, and basically it's a template of is the uh, occupation here today, on, and then we generate a set of these, and then the responses as being one of, one of two of these binary gender options in which the pronoun, she or he, is, is inserted. And so, uh, for a given occupation, overall the model's bias score is the sum of the bias scores for all the question answered templates with that occupation. The scores that skew more um, positive are biased towards female pronouns, and those which have a negative score are biased towards male pronouns. So looking at the table, we have things which are typically dominated by, uh, by women traditionally made, uh, which is, is not necessarily a gendered word. Waitress is necessarily a gendered word, but other things like midwife, receptionist, nanny, nurse, not necessarily gendered, and reflect existing stereotypes in, in the data. Uh, on the other side, you have in those words in occupations exhibiting the highest male bias, Undertaker, which is kind of interesting, janitor, <laughs> referee, plumber, but then you also have ones down like philosopher, philosophy, which is amongst the humanities, the field that has the highest male to female um, uh, inequality of all the humanities. Um, but then you also have terms that have high status um, markers, such as president, coach, captain, maestro, and something to pay specific attention to, engineer. So we've seen that these pre-trained text embeddings, since they're trained on existing Corpa, um, are exhibiting those biases that exist in the real world. And we have to consider whether, how that's going to affect our models downstream. Okay, so that's challenge one. Challenge two is that um, even with the most rigorous and cross-functional training and testing, it is a challenge to ensure a system will be fair across all situations. And for this example, I want to talk about uh, an API, the Perspective API, developed by Jigsaw, which is a part of Alphabet. And it's a tool intended to be used in a wide range of cases, such as supporting human comment moderation, providing feedback to comment authors, and allowing comment viewers to control their experience. And so what it does is it assigns a toxicity score to particular comments. Toxic is defined as a rude, disrespectful, or unreasonable comment that is likely to make one leave a conversation. So the Jigsaw team collected specialized data sets from comment sections in the New York Times and Guardian, Wikipedia talk pages, and they collaborated with groups such as the Anti-Defamation League and Google's employee resource groups to identify toxic language. They also worked within the academic community. They went to the Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency Conference. They ran a workshop and they invited victims of harassment to identify toxic language. Um, so the problem with this is that um, they started to see things in which um, terms or, or sentences uh, were generating tox high toxicity scores that didn't warrant it. And the problem is that existing data sets are small or they have false, false correlations. Well, more seriously, the toxicity model learned that several incorrect associations between toxicity and identities are frequently under attack. So for instance, um, the Gay and Lesbian Film Festival starts today. Really high toxicity score of 0.82, stating that an event is happening today. Being transgender is independent of sexual orientation, a statement about differences between, between gender identity and sexual orientation. Toxicity score of 0.52. A Muslim is someone who follows or practices Islam. Toxicity score of 0.46, literally the definition of a Muslim as having a high toxicity score. Okay, so this is a problem. And so the Jigsaw team um, did a work, this paper by, uh, by uh, Lucas Dixon uh, and colleagues, um, really tried to disentangle what this is. So um, I won't go into the different metrics that they, what they, that they generated, um, called pin uh, area under the curve, but you can check out the paper if you're interested in them. But this qualitative analysis, which comes from a forthcoming paper by Meg Mitchell and, and other folks in the ML Fairness team, highlights the drastic ways that models can change after uh, testing and bias mitigation strategies. 
So in the first version of this model, there's low performance for those terms like lesbian, gay, and trans. The problem is that this is, also, this is also exacerbated when we look at those in conjunction with race terms like Latinx. And so this is pretty consistent with what users of the initial toxicity model found as well. Um, so before developing subsequent versions of the model, the team tested the API with a various number of gender, sexual orientation, or racial, racial categories in conjunction with each other. And to account for them, what they did is that they added in more toxic training, more non-toxic training examples, which contain these words to mitigate the bias. So it's a really good example um, that shows uh, testing across terms across different contexts is important, um, and also testing across um, uh, terms in which considers different cultures, identities, and what we see at the end is a more fair and inclusive product. The third challenge with avoiding or cre creating um, uh, to avoiding, creating, and reinforcing unfair bias is that there's actually no standard definition of fairness, whether decisions are made by humans or machines. So the precise dev definition of fairness has engendered vibrant debates within political philosophy and discrimination law. Uh, if anyone wants to talk John Rawls after the talk, happy to do so. But it's also the case that defining a quantitative definition of fairness is really difficult, and that different definitions are mathematically intractable. So let's take a look at an example. So say we were a bank, and we want to grant loans to people. Um, there's two types of people, blue and orange, and say this is some kind of protected class or sensitive class. Um, and so we're interested in making small loans subject to the following rules. A successful loan makes $300, but an unsuccessful loan costs $700. And then everyone has a credit score um, between zero and 100. Um, and um, so we're, and then we're going to color it as such. Um, those people who are denied a loan but would a default anyway, so that's going to be a true negative, that's going to be a light gray. Those people who are denied a loan but would pay it back, uh, that's, our, that's our false negative, and a dark gray. And then these light blue and orange, those are people who are granted loans but they default, so these are going to be our false positives. And then, these are, and then the people who are granted loans and pay them back, um, uh, those are our two positives, okay? And those are the dark blue and orange, okay? Uh, and if you want to follow along, there's a really great uh, demo on this at research.google.com slash big picture slash attacking discrimination in ML. Okay. So we have a few options here of what we can do. The first thing we could do is say, I don't care about fairness constraints. I just want the most money possible, okay? There's no constraints here. We're just trying to get the most profit. But the two groups have different thresholds, okay? And they're held to different standards. So um, in this case, the blue group is at a disadvantage, is it held to a higher standard? Because a lot of people who could pay back loans are being denied loans. So we have a lot of, um, uh, of these, uh, these false negatives um, compared to the orange case. And so they actually have different thresholds. Our total profit, 32,400. Another constraint we could hold this to is what's called group unaware. We could actually hold these two thresholds as the same. We don't necessarily care primarily about profit maximization, um, but we, we're saying let's, let's set a fair standard for each of these. Let's, let's, uh, in, in this definition, let's set the threshold equal to both. Um, but the, in this case, among the people who would pay back a loan, the orange group is at a disadvantage. Okay? That's because there ignores real differences between the distribution of people who can pay back their loans between the two groups. Another definition is demographic parity. That, that says that the same fractions of blue and orange people within the blue and orange groups get loans. So the number of loans given to each group is the same. So in this case, our positive rate is 37% between the two. Uh, but the blue group is actually at a disadvantage. That's because it only looks at the loans given, not at, not at the rates at which the loans are paid back. So this results in fewer qualified people in the blue group being given loans than in the orange group. And lastly, there is the principle of equal opportunity. The same fractions within the blue and orange group are given to loans um, of the people who can pay them back. So in this case, we're looking at the true positive rate. 67%, we're trying to equalize uh, the threshold such that the true positive rates are equal. In this case, this is 60, 68%. Among the people who would pay back a loan, the blue and orange groups do equally well. So it's about as profitable as demographic parity and about as many people get the loans overall. 
And so to sum up, the group on aware constraint holds that thresholds are the same. The demographic parity constraint requires that the same percentage within each subgroup will, re will receive the loan. And the equal opportunity constraint requires that the same fractions within each subgroup who can pay them off will receive the loan. And I want to emphasize that none of these definitions is necessarily better than the other. Each of them have different mathematical properties, and you can't satisfy them all at once. And which constraint you choose depends a lot on the context of the ML use case and the humans involved. And so in another study by Alice Woodruff uh, and her team investigated how members of potentially affected communities feel about algorithmic fairness. They asked different groups, what's an appropriate definition of unfairness? And it turns out it varies a lot depending on who you're speaking to and their ethical, legal, and economic priorities. So things are considered ethical and moral imperatives, legal requirements, Regu regulatory risk, public relations and brand risk, user trust, agreements with local communities and markets, and much, much more. So unfairness is not immediately obvious, and it requires asking nuanced social, political, and ethical questions. It takes a holistic analysis to consider which definition of fairness is appropriate for your project. So now I've talked to you about the research we've done on fairness and machine learning. I want to present to you two tools that you can actually help and use right now to help you mitigate bias in your own AI and ML applications. The first is the FACETS tool. And what FACETS is, it's a tool for exploratory data analysis where you can, uh, it has two robust visualizations to aid in understanding and analyzing machine learning data sets. You can get a sense of the shape of each feature in your data using FACETS overview and you can explore individual observations using facets dive. So over you, this is the overview visualization, gives you a quick understanding of the distribution of values across the features in your data sets. So you can uncover several, uncom uh, several uncommon and common issues such as unexpected feature values, missing feature values for a large number of observations, training serving skew, and training test validation set skew. So you can dive into this. And so this is the UCI, adult census data set, that many of you have probably seen. But if you don't, uh, it's, a, it's, a pop, it's a publicly drawn data set on uh, the US Census from 1994. And you can see a lot of these missing values in, in capital loss and the distribution plots of each of these. Facets Dive provides an interactive interface for exploring the relationship between data points across all, different, um, all of the different features of a data set. So each individual term in the visualization re represents a data point, um, either both on the left and the right. The left is, a, is an image data set, the right is the, the UCI data set. Um, you can position items by faceting them or bucketing them in multiple dimensions by their feature values. So some success stories that we've seen of Dive include a detection of classifier failure, identification of uh, systemic failures, evaluating ground truth, and potential new signals for, for ranking. So you can see in the data set on the left, we're checking for accurate classifications of images, and we can look for these cases in which a, clat has been, uh, a, a cat has been misclassified as a frog. You can kind of see some frogs in there. Uh, in the data set on the right, we're able to split up the, the census data set by age bins and marital status, and we can change those bin sizes and numbers of categories quickly and easily. So that's slicing into your training, test, and validation data. How about looking into the model itself? And that's where the what if tool comes into play. What if is actually a part of TensorBoard, so you get it automatically if you train jobs on the Google Cloud machine learning engine. So what if it was a collaboration of the TensorFlow uh, team and the pair, the people and AI research teams? So with the what if tool, you can compare a data point to the most similar point where your model predicts a different result, okay? Uh, so if you're familiar with uh, causal inference, this is kind of like if you were looking at uh, 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 um, like a potential outcome of someone that was, had very similar types of characteristics. So we so call such points counterfactuals. And they can shed lights on the decision boundaries of your model. Or you can edit a data point by hand and exam uh, uh, explore how a model's prediction changes. So in the screenshot here, um, the tool's being used on a binary classification model that predicts whether a person earns more than $50,000 or uh, whether they earn less. So in this case, for the selected data point, the model 
uh, predicted with 73% confidence that the person earns more than $50,000. The tool automatically located the most similar person in the data set um, for which the model predicted earnings of less than 50K uh, and compares the two side by side. So in this case, with this a minor difference in age and occupation change, the model prediction has flipped. So you can actually edit these individual points um, and then run your inference again and see what changes. There's a lot more things you can do to what if. You can explore auto-generated partial dependent dependency plots for individual features of a selected data point that show the change in inference results for different valid values of the feature. Um, for classification models, um, you can explore uh, model performance interactively using thresholds, rock curves, numerical <laughs> confusion matrices, and cost ratios. And something that I think is really interesting is that you can actually slice your data into subgroups and test these different algorithmic fairness constraints that we were talking about earlier. So you can um, look at different things like equal opportunity, demographic parity, and group underwear, including several ones that we didn't talk about already. Okay, so where do we go from here? Well, we also have a lot of resources that we're growing in terms of education and training. So one thing you can check out is our machine learning crash, uh, crash course that we have um, that's publicly available on our developer site and now includes a module on fairness. Um, and within that module, you can explore um, quantitative fairness in a notebook-like environment using CoLab. Um, you can also check out um, the first course in our Coursera Inclusive ML module. Um, and the first course is called How Google Does ML. Okay, so we have a module committed to inclusive machine learning where we go into much more detail for designing uh, for inclusion and fairness uh, constraints and how to design fair and inclusive ML for everyone. And you can also learn more if you want to get involved in the community. Um, Google has a set of responsible AI practices that is always being updated on things that we're doing and points to resources. Um, you can also check out the inclusive ML guide that we have that comes along for Google Cloud Auto ML that we, um, that we, that we put together principles of inclusive ML. Um, we've worked on this a bit and then supporting groups including women in NLP, ethics in NLP, black in AI, Latinx in AI, and queer in AI. And we've also been working with the algorithmic fairness and opacity working group at UC Berkeley. Okay. And with that, thank you so much for the opportunity and I really look forward to your questions. Thank you, Alex. Any questions? Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I actually have two questions. Yes. The first one is, uh, well, is a little bit of data. So do you have any statistics on how many mi fairness mistakes we've made <laughs> if they are decreasing or are increasing or are the same or something like that? And the second is, how many philosophers does Google hire? <laughs> That's such a good question. Um, okay, so the first is that do we have a catalog of fairness mistakes we're making? That's a, that's a hard question to answer, one, because fairness, again, it, is hard to identify. And among different fairness, um, it depends how you define fairness. So for instance, one of the examples, there was a, the article on the Compass algorithm, which, uh, uh, which is, had been used for pretrial risk assessment. And in that case, um, ProPublica, the uh, uh, nonprofit journalism um, uh, a place, uh, outfit, had done an analysis to show that there was a difference between um, white and black defendants here and, 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 and how it overestimated black, black defendants. North Point, the company that created it, um, responded and said, no, no, we didn't. But they were using a different type of fairness definition for this. So to actually identify holistically how many fairness violations that we have been making, that's a super hard question to answer. Um, and defining the problem in the academic community is something that's still going about. So your second question, how many philosophers does Google employ? There is one philosopher that we work with. Her name is Shannon Valor. She's a, earth, uh, she's a virtue ethicist at Santa Clara University. And she has been writing on tech and ethics for 
a few decades, I want to say now. We've also got a few people who has who also are have philosophy backgrounds. But she's a she's kind of the the um, probably the only true philosopher that we have working with us. But it's uh, yeah. So if you're a philosopher, know somebody. <laughs> Thank you so much for your very important talk and all your excellent work in this space. Uh, my question is not quite as thoughtful. Um, <laughs> more operational, um, can you share any case studies or experience where you've had to work with data scientists where they prefer to, for natural language processing models, for instance, they just want to get as much data as possible, throw even more at it, aggregate it, enhance it, make it larger and larger, and expect that the bias will somehow normalize and mm. sort of be raised off because you've got a larger data set. Mm -hmm. How have you addressed, if, if any, if you've had a case example yeah. that you can share where you've said, now, here are some of the things that you need to do tactically. Right, right. That's a great question. And I, I unfortunately don't have any stories in which I've, I've done that kind of work to work with data scientists and say, you know, where are you looking at this? But I think. I think uh, you know an advi advice for data scientists is to consider where the data is coming from, what pot think through the potential biases in which where the data are coming from, and test those in certain ways that address things like sensitive groups and characteristics, and that may uh, address the lack of good data for particular groups like that. But um, yeah, I, I unfortunately don't have kind of hands-on stories. I think I think that's I think it's an important step, and I think it also needs to happen throughout. I would say that I I want to resist the impulse of saying that testing for fairness is one kind of checkbox that you do and at the at the end, but more of it it exists at each point at the data pipeline. Greetings. First of all, to tie a couple things together, from graduated from University of Madison with a degree in philosophy and computer science, to tie in another question here, <laughs> had to do computer science because there were no philosopher wanted ads. I guess things have changed. <laughs> the question. Over the holidays, I had a spirited conversation with a relative who's a Fox News kind of a person. And in this conversation, I said, so what is the textbook definition of socialism? Could not give it to me, because I had studied some economics at Wisconsin, mm -hmm. so you know the textbook definition of it. So when it comes to toxic language, knowing that we don't even know our own English language, is there any sensitivity to toxicity knowing that some people use a word that they don't even understand? So that's a, that's a really important, that's a really good point. So considering the kind of the context around language and the fact that even some words are used in different ways and, and become mobilized in different ways, I can't speak extensively to the toxicity model and what the what the work is done uh, I think some of the work that the jigsaw team has done and published has focused on that but I think that that does highlight the way that certain words gain undue association so it might be the case where um, you know you 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 see tweets that come from um, certain Fox News hosts who, who tweet, this is what socialism is, and then certain actual socialists going like, yeah, that sounds great, you know, so. Uh, and so I think there is a risk there in having a single model and saying this is a single score, depending on the context. Um, but I can't speak to the specifics of how the toxicity model. Um, so I encourage you to go, into, go to uh, check out Jigsaw's work and see what the work they've done around it to get a sense of how they've handled that. Any more questions? I guess two things. I would think there would be certain sort of practices by some social science, sciences, such as anthropology, which have kind of dealt with trying to uh, look at certain societal practices in a critical uh, gaze. Is there any type of kind of practices from social sciences which might be applicable to what we're trying to accomplish? And then at the same time, I would think there's, we need to be asking what type of 
um, kind of societal practices are we trying to um, not reinforce, not perpetuate? Mm -hmm. For instance, are we not trying to perpetuate discrimination, racism? So mm -hmm. if you're looking at uh, predictive policing, I mean, you don't want to look at as crime statistics. You want to see how a community has been redlined, for instance, would be an example. Mm -hmm. So really thinking critically at the front end about how we're kind of framing our, the questions that we're trying to ask. Yeah, so those are really, really important questions. So one, the first question is, what kind of ways have social scientists been doing investigations or brought a critical lens to the field of this kind of field of fairness and technology. Would that, would that, is that a good approximation of the question? Yes. Okay, so I'd say, yeah, so one thing um, that, one community that Google's been part of is called the uh, Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency Community uh, that has a conference later this month. And that is an effort to bring together both computer scientists, social scientists, and legal scholars um, to talk about different definitions of fairness, not only in technol not only in the technology itself and the data, but also in practices and developing data science teams and what the field looks like overall. And so that's, that's one venue, I think, where research is being done. And within Google, we have a set of social scientists that also work who come from uh, different disciplines, such as information, uh, information science, uh, psychology and, 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 and sociology as a sociologist, yes. Um, the, latter, um, the latter question is about whether, like what, what, our, what our goals are basically, as you know, how, what are we doing here? You know, we're, we're not only, and we're not only trying to, um, we're not only trying to develop tools which reflect the existing distribution of, equality, of inequality, but what we're trying to do, have tools which are fair and inclusive for whomever uses them. And so fairness rule, you know, fairness itself, um, you know, one view of fairness is that you, is ameliorative. Um, ameliorative. And, and I think we move more from fairness there, more into a conversation about justice. Um, so that's a, you know, whether, whether tools can be used for that, is I think it's a, it's a, it's a good discussion. Um, and I think it's one that's happening within the fairness, accountability, and transparency community right now. So I think that's a really important point. Final question. Yeah, um, so thank you uh, both for the talk and for the introduction. So I've, I've seen both what if and, and facets showing up, you know, here and there, mm -hmm. people using them. So. I guess my question is, say if I've, I have a, a data set and I find this algorithm I'm, I'm going through exploring with either of those tools or with you know, whatever other visualization libraries and I discover, oh, there's, there's a bias here that I, I think is unfair. What, what do you think is a, a good way to rectify that? Is it in um, somehow doing active learning like we heard about yesterday, really fine tuning? What, what data do I send, do I choose to, to train on or is it more a matter of like adjusting cost functions or I guess what's what's sort of that next step after you discover or or is silence I think sometimes we've we've seen that there's questions my Google home refuses to answer so right yeah I that's I think it depends a lot on your context in your case I, it, I there's no one size fits all in terms of it in terms of toxicity we saw that they added more non-toxic training data for each of those identities where it was Latinx, queer, Latinx, gay. Um, so that might be one thing. It might be the case that you want to um, optimize for um, an, equal, an equality of opportunity in, in a binary classification task. And I think that depends a lot on thinking through how users are going to be affected and really understanding that and what, what, those, what's the, what that's going to be. So for instance, um, in the loan case, are you know, there's the the interests of the you as the bank, but there's also the interests of the users and the and the, and the people getting the loan and people being. What are the considerations of people being denied a loan? How's that going to affect their lives compared to what's happening with with 
with the person making these decisions. And so there's a, a great paper um, that's being published at Fatstar by Ben Hutchinson and, and Meg Mitchell, who are on the ML fairness team, that sort of has a dividing line and kind of considers what is like um, kind of what different definitions of fairness do from kind of this perspective of who is um, kind of like who who it impacts in some kind of way, and they divide these into different different statistical definitions. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to give you a very social science type of answer. It's very contextual. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks again, Alex.